everyone. Welcome to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Hussey. So this is the show where we discuss the tools, the tricks, the stumbling blocks to the writing process, but also we offer the rarely seen behind the scenes um, view from the industry side. And we try and cover everything in between. So basically, Marissa and I are trying to give you guys the tools that it takes to maybe get your book on the shelf because I, I think it's not as scary as it looks. Um, we are on every Friday at 2 p.m. So make sure to click the link below to subscribe and then you'll be alerted ahead of every episode. So what are we talking about today? So we're going to talk more in detail about the process of editing today. So we actually will have a real live editor with us. So you will know that we haven't just made all this up. <laughs> Um, so we're talking more about the two di two different times that you need to edit your work as an author, right? Before you submit your manuscript and proposal to an agent, and then if you do, you know, if and when you do get your very own editor at a publisher. Yeah, and uh, you know, when we touched on this in a previous episode, and I was coming at it from the self-publishing perspective, which is a slightly different beast. And, you know, I was really looking into that as far as kind of getting a professional editor. And it was something that I really considered seriously before I started sending out my manuscript on submissions. And even when I decided to self-publish, I was still considering polishing it up by using a different pair of eyes. Because at that point I was doing like, you know, 50 different drafts and I was going nuts. So, yeah. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a bit more about what you found when you were researching that aspect, when you were looking for maybe maybe using editors before you started querying agents? So, you know, maybe what rates you found, what kind of backgrounds and levels of expertise you saw people had? Yeah, I mean, um, I did get suggestions from agents who were very kind in kind of saying, listen, you know, we're not going to take you on, but um, you might think about hiring a professional editor. And they gave me some names. Uh, which was great. And then I compared them to people that I researched myself. So some of my favorite books, I just then kind of dug for information about those authors. And then I came up with um, if those authors used editors before they went out on submission. And it's amazing what you can find on the internet. Um, you know, and I did reach out to professional editors and the average for say like, my book at that point was about a hundred thousand words. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was looking at about thirty five hundred dollars mm -hmm. for a line edit. So that means forensically, the way I understood it, forensically going through, you know, each line of the whole book, and then not only giving suggestions about how the plot could go, your pacing, any grammatical errors, typos. So it was very comprehensive. And I thought, I mean, that's pretty great. Mm -hmm. You have the, if you can afford it and you, you have the means to do that, I think that would be really helpful, yeah. you know, but I'm quite curious, you know, as to what fiction editors do when they're in the industry. So after you get an agent, because, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's like a much more complicated process. Sure. <laughs> Um, well, and here we come to the acquisition meeting, right? Known colloquially in publishing as simply acquisitions. One that might fancy. That sounds very fancy. Explain that, please. <laughs> well, one might call it the room where it happens. Um, if you're if you're Donald the Hamilton reference. Uh, so, what the acquisitions meeting is is you know the time, the first time in most cases that an editor presents a book that they want to acquire. To some of the you know more more important uh, decision makers at the company, right? Because an editor can't just say, "Yeah, yeah, I want to buy this book. I'm going to I'm going to do it. Here we go. Let's talk to the agent." You know, they there are budgets, of course, that need to be stuck to, oh, and, yeah. you know, and decisions that need to be made with the entire company in mind. So, uh, you know, many times I would be asked by an editor right, in advance of this meeting to look into an author, right, come up with ideas why this would be a good book to purchase and bring onto the list. Maybe if there were any other digital products that could go along with it and support either the book from a marketing perspective or be its own its own thing and might be another, you know, another revenue stream for, uh, for us. And, you know, that might mean looking at web data or social media data, or, you know, analytics that we had our, our own comparable authors that the, that the editor was, you know, was trying to 
to make a make a case that this this new author right. might be like. Um, you know, or simply lending my expertise in digital spaces, right, to make a case for why the book might sell, uh, because that is ultimately what you're trying to do at this at this. So that's, so that's even before they get their hands on it. So it, you can't even. It's yeah, exactly. Yes, um, it's you know, t typically. So unless there is a time constraint given by an agent, right, uh, that means the submission cannot wait until that meeting or the following meeting. Meet following meeting, um, you know, an editor will bring something they want to purchase there. Uh, you know, the, typically we, we know it's, you know, there are some books that are, you know, that need to be, you need to turn around within, you know, 48 hours or something like that to be considered, but for the no most- No pressure, no pressure. No, I know. Um, you know, in that case, you see editors kind of frantically running around trying to get the publisher, trying to get the MD, you know, trying to get the CEO, because, you know, depending on how much you need to be yeah, yeah. in the book, you know, there's all sorts of approvals that need to happen, all sorts of people who need to, you know, read the text very quickly, get, you know, get in their opinions and figure out if you can, finan you know, if you're going to financially float this project. So it's, you know, stuff can be hectic, but typically it's a bit, it's a bit slower. Um, and, you know, the meeting that you bring this you know, this piece too, uh, it, you know, will have representation from around the company, right? So heads of sales, heads of marketing, heads of other imprints, other editors, that can sometimes be a lot of pressure, um, especially in cases like, uh, like we've, we've, you know, we'll talk about in other, other episodes where you, uh, you may have two editors competing for a title, <laughs> um, you know, that tends to not happen because there are rules kind of preventing those situations, but it can happen. Um, you know, so this is why we talk so much about creating the impression that you are sellable because all of these people with their different purviews are going to be listening to your potential editor. Yeah. Uh, talk about why they want you and your book and weighing in with their opinion on whether this is a good acquisition for the company. So you need to appeal to not just an editor's sensibilities when you're putting yourself out there, but you need to appeal to a marketer's sensibilities and a publicist's sensibilities. Yeah. You need all of them to easily see why you are, you know, a sure thing. Of course. And I think when we bring out our guest, I think she will probably no doubt explain all the different hats she has to wear and all the different perspectives she has to have. So I can't imagine that that's an easy process. Of course not. I think it's one of probably one of the most hectic, you know, hectic pieces of the whole puzzle. So yeah. Amazing. So before we bring her out, though, let's get ready for our What Makes Us Look Great. So on how many books can one find a plethora of articles titled some version of how to read this book? <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> I mean, you need other people telling you how to get through this book. Um, so Infinite Jest is called David Foster Wallace's Magnum Opus. You know, he first submitted a draft to his editor in December of 1993. Excerpts were published throughout 1995, and the book was ultimately published in 1996. And Wallace's editor was, of course, Michael Peach, who is now the CEO of Hachette Book Group in the U.S. So I have personally had Infinite Jest on my, you know, New Year's resolution um, list for uh, 15 years. Um, and I have yet to get around to it, uh, much to the dismay of a, of, a, of a good friend for many years. But Tatiana, as a writer, tell us what makes this book great. Okay, so this book has been uh, sitting on my poor bookshelf. And the bookshelf has been groaning under its weight for ages. And my husband and I both mm -hmm. started reading it and stopped and started and stopped. And I just cannot and have not yet gotten through it. I will eventually. <laughs> but to me, to me, I think almost the content is not necessary in a way. I mean, I think it's my brain hurts. Mm -hmm. trying to to digest all of it but the sheer audacity for a, a writer to submit a book like this I I'm honestly I am floored that 
somebody from an agent to an editor looked at it and said, okay, I'm willing to take that on. How long, how long would it take to get through it and say, right, okay, here's where I see the genius. Here's where I see the nuance. I mean, it's over a thousand pages. I feel like it's completely unique in its format. I mean, much like we, we always say in what makes this book great, it's not a book review. It's more about the, the sheer novelty that some books bring to the market, you know? And I think this is just wild. I mean, it's wild. And for David Foster Wallace to have the guts to do something like that is just extraordinary and stubborn. (laughs) What did you think? I, I mean, his obsession with the English language is, you know, is so apparent in, in, in all of his writing and all of his work. Uh, and it's, that's the thing I think that stands out most about him and, you know, and particularly this book, you know, the, the, the thing <laughs> that, is, that is so compelling about it is just how dense it is and how complex yeah. it is and all of the footnotes and the references and, you know, having to kind of be all over the place, really, and being in someone else's mind to understand not just the story, but how they went about getting to the story. And that, you know, it's this, this really amazing thing, kind of like, you know, you know Heart of Darkness style, where the language itself right. is the, you know, the, is part of the, the beauty of the writing. And that's unique completely unique just like you said there you know there are very few people who could do something like this and have it actually come across and not be a jumbled mess I mean yeah. people try to write in this style and it's doesn't work so you know, what, you know what's interesting is that what what you are talking about is also writing based you're coming at it from a creative standpoint which is really interesting because normally you see it from the industry yep. standpoint and what you've just shown is that something like this, the content, the, the can't be ignored. So maybe I was incorrect in saying it doesn't, you know, it kind of doesn't matter. But then from a writing perspective, how do you sit there and, and keep going? Well, I, mean, I, th- I, th- I think that one of, it is, uh, it, is a cre- it is commentary on the creative work, however, yeah. It is also, I, you know, I can't, of course, divorce these two things in my mind. It is coming at it from, that is why it is compelling to a very specific kind of person, you know, and from a marketing standpoint, and, and it's not, you know, not to say that this is about the book being marketed, but how the shape it has taken now and continues to take is that you have a certain kind of person who believes themselves to be a certain type of person who wants to be able to say that they've read this book. Um, that's and, so fascinating. That's such a great point. I uh, completely, yeah. It's you know, it is. There are lots of lots of articles out there and lots of you know supporting supporting work on you know why people buy this book, why people want to have it on their bookshelves, why people want to show off essentially that they you know yeah they, they read this book, and you know is because it is one of those books that kind of becomes a badge of honor. If you have read this this book, you are smart, of course. Yeah. You, Smart because if you made it through it, you you know you you must be very very clever, very intelligent. And <laughs> I do I do think to a degree that's probably true. Um, I think you also have to not have anything else going on. Um, I know. I was going to say, how much time do you have to divide? Ignore your ignore your family. Ignore your commitments. <laughs> just do, do this. Just read this. I yeah. saw someone saying like you have to commit to reading like ten pages a day. You can do more than that, but you can never do. <laughs> That. And then once you, you know, you kind of get in a rhythm um, and because that's one of the biggest things, right, is actually becoming comfortable with his way of speaking and his way of delivering. Yeah. And once True. you get the flow of that and you, you know, start to feel the rhythm, it's much easier to actually start to enjoy the book and, you know, and keep, keep going. Um, I think it's really, it's an, it's an amazing thing that it has inspired so many people in so many different ways. You know, I love yeah. it of art, inspiring art, you know, it's uh, David Foster Wallace, you know, and Infinite Jest specifically, you know, have inspired 
everything from you know titles of Simpsons episodes to you know Decemberists. So true. Uh, yeah. Music videos and yeah, it's it's kind of really fascinating that people who do connect with this book really connect with this book and yeah, like everything we've always said about what you know what makes a great book. Yeah. I'd love to see, like, I think the, I'm, I'm hoping that people will leave comments about this specifically, because I'd love to hear what people thought about it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people will probably like, I'm never reading that ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's so intimidating. Yeah. I think one of the things that um, actually has compelled me, has always compelled me to, you know, to really, to, to finally read it, um, is how um, David Foster Wallace and Michael Peach work together on, yeah. and, during the revisions, how much back and forth there was. There's actually a really, a really amazing, uh, amazing piece out there uh, that Michael Peach wrote after um, David Foster Wallace died about their relationship. That's really fascinating. Um, wow. Put a link in the um, in the video description so everyone can read it. Yeah, definitely. And actually, this is a good lead in to mm -hmm. our guest because I'd love to hear what Laura has to say about a book that would drop onto her desk. That's over a thousand pages. I'm just wondering if she would just go, nope. Okay. Uh, so let's bring her on, Laura Gerard. Hello. Hello. Hi. So I'm going to introduce you. So today is Laura Gerard. So she is a freelance editor now who has uh, over 10 years of experience in the publishing industry. So most recently, she was a commissioning editor at Orion, where she worked with many award-winning and Sunday Times and New York Times bestselling authors. Uh, she has worked for Cotter and Stone as an ebook proofreader before. She was also an intern at the Blake Friedman Literary Agency. Um, she has an MA in publishing, so she is very smart. Um, sorry, very clever. Um, I, gotta, I sometimes forget to translate, you know, my, uh, my UK, UK, US book. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, so she has an MA in publishing from University College London. She has appeared on panels for the Romantic Novelist Association and has been on the judging panel for the Crime Writers Association Debut Dagger Award. So she knows a good thing when she sees it. Um, she also is the person I attribute with teaching me to make a respectable cup of tea. <laughs> As an American. England. Every American needs to know how to do that. Yes. Uh, you, need <laughs> you need your person who is going to guide you and teach you. And let me tell you, I was making them for a few years. And then one, one time I had a, a real good tutorial over a few days with Laura. And I came home that night and I made myself a cup of tea. And I went, oh, life changing. This is totally important great. life skills. Very, yeah. very important. Yeah. I was. I, I thought I was going to be fired once when I was working at an agency, and I made the tea so milky. Everybody in the office stopped doing what they were doing, and they just looked at me. I was like, "Oh, I, I think I just did that really wrong." <laughs> it's fraud. It is really, oh, really high yeah. pressure thing as an American to be in an environment with English people. <laughs> when it's your turn to make the tea, and you're just like, nah, "I don't." Yeah. You freeze. You just freeze. <laughs> I sympathize, but I'm glad you've both got that. <laughs> <laughs> I owe right. So, Laura, can Hello. you tell us what the editing process is in a large publishing house so from when you receive a submission that you're really excited about to final publication? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, like you said, I'm now a freelancer, so I'm not sort of in that anymore. I've been out of house for about two years now, but um, I was in house um, for nine years. Um, so I sort of went to a lot of uh, acquisitions meetings and had a lot of submissions, but um, when you get that one, like you say, that drops into your inbox and it feels really special, um, you sort of, the process is like you read it and you love it. Um, and then the first thing you have to do is um, sort of ask yourself why you love it. So uh, do you just love it because it reads nicely? Do you love it because they've got a really nice tone, like way of writing? Like, do you love it because the author is a journalist who's already got a massive Twitter following or what have you like why do you love it because it's not enough just to just to love the words you've got to be able to see how to pitch it and position it and sell it to people oh. um, so you have to sort of like ask yourself those questions um, and then the editorial teams have smaller editorial meetings just within themselves and that's where you'd sort of bring up anything interesting that you've been reading. Um, so it might be that 
you know you're really keen on something and you and you want to take it forward it might be that you're kind of on the fence about something or it might be that um another an editor has got something and they can't quite see how to pitch it but but they might know that you love it so it's a really sort of collegiate atmosphere where you sort of find within yourselves who are the, the best people to be publishing that book if you do want to publish it um so if everyone sort of sounds, thinks it sounds great like they'd all chip in and have a read of it and then if you still thought oh yeah definitely let's go ahead with this you'd start to sort of plan to take to acquisitions so there's usually paperwork to do and you would uh, distribute it to all the sort of key teams that I know you've already mentioned, but you know, the sales team, the rights team, uh, marketing publicity, all the, the, the decision makers. Um, and sales would have a meeting with amongst themselves where they talk about everything that's going to the meeting that week and um, come up with like their best estimate for how many they think they could sell. Um, and the rights team would do similar, um, depending on what rights were on offer for the book and what territories they'd come up with, you know, what sort of rights income they think they, they'd be able to offer into it as well. Um, and then, you know, that's all based on how well you've pitched it, how well you've positioned it. You know, have you sort of found a way to sell this book that has given everybody who actually hasn't read it yet because you know they don't have time to read every submission coming in that week um, you know someone who hasn't read it have you found a way to find a way to sort of show them what the book is in you know sort of a paragraph um, and that's before the meeting but then you go to the meeting and you will actually do your sort of passion pitch for the book and you'll sort of stand up and and tell people about the book and how you think you can sell it and what else it's like, what else it's selling like, what you think, um, you know, how the, the author is and, and all that sort of the passion stuff that you can only really sort of get from an acquiring editor to talk about about it and hopefully get everybody else excited about the book as well. Um, and then in that meeting, you'll sort of get your, um, they'll put your figures in and you'll get given sort of an amount that you're allowed to, to offer. Um, and then you can go make your offer. Um, so that would be then the time to sort of get on the phone to the um, agent and not only give them the money, because of course that's a very important part of, of the deal, but it's not everything. Like there's quite often where authors don't take the, the most money because you know they might have like struck up a bond with the editor or they might prefer the publication plan of a of a different um publishing house and um so it's all about talking about the money but also like how you see you would you'd sell it like how you'd publish it like what sort of book you would publish it as like you know what sort of editorial work that you might want to do you know because some editors might see quite a lot of editorial work needed to do that the author is like ready to roll up their sleeves and get stuck in but another editor might think oh no actually we want to pitch it more like this so actually we're quite happy with how it reads now so interesting. Yeah. yeah i'm 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 gonna approach it from the slightly kind of creative side more because yeah i'm obviously there is a specific process you're working within kind of certain parameters but within that do you feel like you're you still have the autonomy to say but I really really want to work on this if you fall in love with something or are you told well actually we're going to focus on this submission before you know are you able to kind of meander within those or do you have to stick to a certain path I think it's it's always a discussion um, and you know sort of yeah you talk it's because it at that point it becomes sort of not just your your book it's sort of ev it's the teams then you know it's like the whole team is publishing this book so you know they might all have ideas of how to publish it but then of course you do want to be speaking to the author and the agent all the time and it's just so important to make sure like from the very beginning within that acquisitions process that ideas are all aligned and it's not sort of you, know, you don't want to acquire the book and make promises and then come down further down the line yeah. and realize that everybody is thinking different things so that's sort of why that you know it's not just the money that's the important thing like you know these big six-figure advances might you know just be dazzling and you know you think you've got to jump at it but it's so much 
it's so much more than that it's such a team effort at this point so you know it's you do really need to have those discussions to make sure that you're all thinking the same things and having the same ambition and, and vision for the book yeah and I'm so glad you said that because sometimes the assumption from the writers or the new authors is that it's completely taken out of their hands suddenly and then the machine keeps going without them and i think what's really great is you saying it's actually as collaborative as we can make it because the author is just one part of that team that yeah. is trying to bring the story to life and that it, it still means yes you still have a job to do the industry still wants to sell it but also it's great that the the writer is there you know it probably feels so personal to them yeah I love that I love that it's communicated to them saying well you know you have all these options let's kind of work together to make sure that this is as great as it can be definitely. as long as you you feel comfortable with it definitely it's like on Laura's behalf too that I know she won't say for herself but Laura explains it this way because she is a very good editor and she was very oh. Thank you. <laughs> I think as an author and agents, you know, you're, you have to be able to see through that when you get a proposal from someone, if it is, like Laura said, if it's going to stay true the whole time and throughout your partnership together. And, you know, Laura is someone who would, of course, always ensure that that was happening and that promises were kept. Um, but that's something you have to really, really get a sense of and, and be quite sure of, I think, as an author. Before you make yeah, that. I think it's really sort of key for the the relationship as well because you might be buying a three book you know you might be have a three book contract and you know it's all set in those relationships from the beginning and you know you don't want it's they've created it it's their thing you don't want to just all of a sudden be like okay now it's ours you know it's so important to because they're you know the author is the artist and they're the one having the ideas and it it can just become so much more of a discussion about about things um but you know a lot of authors are also then very um you know they're just aware of what they don't know as well so it's just so important for everybody to be talking constantly and sort of you know the authors can trust um the in-house experts and we can trust the um the out-of-house experts so yeah. it's just such a collaborative process have have you ever had the experience where you've been given something and you're collaborating with either the agent or somebody else as well as the author where you're saying I think this book is better made into two books or a trilogy. How do you how do you approach that kind of you know situation? Does is that something that the author needs to decide, or is that something where the agent and the editor and whoever is saying, actually, let's build it into something that's a little bit more sustainable? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's one of those things that is crucial to be having at the early, you know, conversation to be having early on. If you, you know, if you haven't acquired the book yet, it's, and you have that idea, it's, you know, it's, a, you know, especially if it's quite an ambitious idea, um, you know, you need to know if it's feasible, if the author's got that much story in them, if, you know, if they can see the characters like holding out for that long and what have you. And, yeah. um, so, you know, it's important to have those um, conversations early, but I can't imagine that anyone would ever sort of force an author that way if it wasn't the way that they wanted to go you know it wouldn't be that oh we've acquired it and now we'll head that way but yeah. um you know it's one of those things where it can be oh we'll have the conversation because I have this idea but you might have a better idea so you know coming off the back yeah. of that so you know that's why it's just so important to keep it sort of as a conversation but I don't think I've ever had anything like that where I've like sort of split anything into a trilogy or what have you like I've, I've worked on trilogies and series and, yeah. and what have you but I don't think there's ever been a, a specific situation where that's come up but um but yeah there have been times for example where I was acquired a book and started talking about it as a crime novel and the author didn't realize that she'd written a crime novel like she had she just <laughs> It that way like it was sort of a crime thriller and she was like I just didn't see it as a crime thriller so you know luckily those conversations happen quite early on but um you know they do happen and it's um yeah so it's just so important to have those conversations yeah there's a, there's a trust, yeah there's a trust there isn't there you know yeah, definitely. That's, that's really important Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something that, you know, the authors put, you know, at least a year, surely, of their life, at least, the bare minimum of their life into, and, you know, put everything onto those pages, and it's, 
you know it's quite a special thing that you're handing over to an editor so yeah. it is an important relationship so um yes yeah, the trust is absolutely crucial and now so um what are you working on now what's has your um, workload changed since you've gone freelance what's it like yes it's changed a lot um so i went freelance a couple of years ago we wanted to to relocate so um um, and also my favorite part of the whole publishing process was actually the editing. Um, and when you're an editor in house, of course you do do that, but you have a lot of other things to do as well. You're sort of a project manager really, and you're sort of managing the whole process and you're mm -hmm. liaising with all the different teams and pulling everything together. Um, and I sort of felt that my passion and my strengths were more focused on the stories and the characters. So um, my days now are very much just focused on the manuscript, which is um, like a huge luxury for me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really different. I've sort of just picked out my favorite part of being an editor and sort of That's have great. been doing that. So yeah, I am very lucky. I'm really enjoying myself. That's good. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you do when someone wants to hire you as a freelance editor? Because obviously yeah. you do a few different things. Obviously I do everything from proofreading to structural edits, right? Yeah, so I um, I work for like, so sometimes I work directly with the publishers, whether that's structural edit, a copy edit or a proofread, I do sort of all of those. Um, sometimes I work for, um, you know, like uh, Tatiana was saying earlier when she was submitting to, agents and they sort of recommended people like there's you know agents will sometimes send people to me when they're like oh it's nearly there but it's not quite you'd really benefit from working with someone so they sort of um have very kindly sent them my way um and i sort of work with uh, so publishing houses and uh, literary consultancies and then with authors directly um either when they're planning on self-publishing or if they're just getting their book ready to um submit to an agent and um, yeah, so the process, I sort of would talk to them a bit at the beginning about what, what their aims are for the for, for it and whether quite often they just want me to go in blindly and, and you know, see what I think or they, or they might have very idea, very sort of strong ideas about where the book is falling down and they're like, you know, I really need, like, you know, my dialogue isn't great or characterization isn't great or I know this plot point doesn't work, like, can you help me with this? So um, it's all, it's very much, I work in a very sort of author led way, um, you know, cause it's, it's a financial investment. So I want to make sure that someone feels that they're getting what they, what they want. So um, I work in a very sort of author led, led way and um, keep it, keep a dialogue going and just very much sort of be very honest about, about what's, what's good and what's bad um you know what's working and what isn't working like where it could fit in the market and just try and help people see through to the bits that you know if they have been working on it for say five years and you just get to that point where you can't see the wood for the trees anymore so i can sort of come in and just sort of like knock some of the branches away and and sort of help them see yeah what, what it is that they've got and what they could have and it's not about changing you know working working with a freelance editor wouldn't be about sort of changing the essence of the book or what the book is but it's just about making sure that the potential that is there is sort of really brought out and um, so when you know if it is someone who's planning to submit to agents it's uh you know making sure that when they get in front of that agent it's in the best shape it can be um because often when you um do submit to an agent you sort of get one chance with them they often won't yeah. read it unless there has been sort of huge changes um so not everybody has to work with um with a freelance editor you know a lot of people don't and a lot of people get really great deals from it but it's when those people sort of know for sure that they definitely you know they know where that they need work on it and you know then they feel that they can sort of work with somebody and make it much better hopefully that's where i can come in to help so. you you declutter the creative closet yes that is a much more succinct way of saying what I just said. <laughs> I, I, you could edit me. <laughs> You're good at this. Yeah. <laughs> you should try it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I keep saying is that, you know, hiring a, an editor before you go to an agent, I mean, in terms of return on investment, you know, that, that's one of the things that you do want to seriously consider because, 
just like you said, it typically it's a, you know, it's one chance to get it right. And yeah. if that, you know, that money that you spent on a freelance editor to start is the reason that you end up getting a book deal, then of course that might, you know, that might be worth it. Yeah. yeah. I really would like to think that it is a return on investment. Like, you know, it is an investment and, but quite often, um, you know, not always, but sometimes when, when people come to freelance editors, it's the first time that they've really thought about it as a business and as sort of, you know, a commercial, uh, you know, commercial thing that they have, like, you know, how, you know, you, do you actually want, you know, you want to make money from this and how, because that's how in-house people see it. They see in it as commercial prospect, like, and it's so important, you know, I like to encourage authors to see it in the same way and you know, take them, like, distance themselves a once the editing's done, distance themselves a little bit and see where like, what have you got to sell now? Like what is it that will make an, some a book, you know, someone on Amazon or strolling through Waterstones pick up your book and buy it? Like so it's make you know encouraging them as well to sort of think about it as you know money. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly put. It's, oh. it's, I mean, this has been hugely helpful, honestly, like from like the amount of information and the way you've approached it. And it's so engaging, honestly, um, Laura, it's just honestly, I'd like the, the amount of information that people wouldn't necessarily know had we not had you on here. It's just brilliant. Oh, you oh know? Thank you. But before you go, we mm -hmm. want to know, it's a very important question. Okay. Desert Island book. Oh, just Tough one, one. <laughs> yeah okay i expect that everybody's gonna say that yes <laughs> oh no yeah um i think my sort of go-to favorite author uh would be oh if i've got one book on a desert island it's probably going to be an ian McEwan novel um oh. probably atonement just i think that was my first one in and it was sort of yeah. but then enduring love has that like perfect first chapter so either of those but I just think with him you just know you're going to get you're in safe hands you know you can just sort of it's it's yeah you just know you're going to get a great read and you're feeling very like it, isn't it the way he writes yeah, yeah, definitely yeah so yeah I think it would be probably atonement excellent choice in my opinion I think so. Um, so last thing Laura yes how would someone get in touch with you if they were hoping to work with you Oh, um, probably the best way would be to um, email me or I am on Twitter as well. And my email address is in my bio on Twitter. So it's just, um, yeah, Laura Gerard. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you thank so much for having me. Time. It's been great having you. Oh, thank you very much. It's a really great show you're doing. So thank you for including me. It was a lot of fun. And I really hope people see this and see like and reach out to you and understand that that's it's a very detailed and very long winded and complicated process. But the most important thing about an editor is that they work with the author. It's yeah. not something that's taken out of their hands. I think it's wonderful that, you know, authors feel kind of feel like their work is being taken care of, which is great. Yeah, we are the sort of the caretakers. So yeah, it's important that people know that, you know, it's it's collaborative. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Right. So that is it from us. It's been an amazing episode. I loved hearing that, honestly, from just the writing perspective, honestly, like knowing how much care is put into a body of work is great because I I really assumed, I was one of the people that assumed that it's just kind of they make the decisions. <laughs> without you you some, know some do some like <laughs> you know, really I mean, with you. and that's you know it's the same with any job there are good ones and bad ones yeah but I'm honestly like I'm really pleased so that was really fun I'm so glad you guys everybody's watching thank you so much for joining us today it's been really great remember we are on every Friday so don't forget to click on the link to subscribe and please feel free to leave us questions and comments. We will address them. We have so much to talk about all the time. So many parts of the industry and the creative process. And we love doing it. So thanks so much for being here. See you next week.